Welcome to Just Want a Quilt, a research podcast coming out of Tulane University Law School, where we explore all kinds of things, stories about quilting, tools, field trips, maybe some famous quilters stop by, and of course, a little bit of copyright thrown in just for fun. This is Elizabeth Townsend Gard, your host, and I'm a law professor at Tulane University Law School and a faculty fellow at the A.B. Friedman School of Business at Tulane. And I just want a quilt. Today we talk to quilter Jeff Rutherford. We talk about all kinds of things, art quilts, um, teaching, um, treadle machines, and of course, Jeff's quilting life. Sure. Uh, I'm Jeff Rutherford, and I am calling you from Florence, Massachusetts, which, yeah. is a na- which is a neighborhood of Northampton, Mass. Northampton, Mass. So how far are you from the New England Quilt Museum? Um, I'm about an hour and maybe 20 minutes from the New England Quilt Museum. That's, that's cool. Um, I love the New England Quilt Museum. It's so cool. Um, okay, cool. Well, what's your and, first And I'm the, I'm the president of the Northampton Modern Quilt Guild. Oh, you are. Interesting. Interesting. Okay, we have to talk about that. Uh, how big is the group? Uh, I think members, I think we have, uh, I should know the exact number. I think we have about 34, 35. Nice. Um, okay. We have a core group of probably 20 members who come to most of the meetings. Oh, that's nice. That's a nice size. That's like yeah. enough without it being like you can be really friends and like, I don't know, things get big. It, it just, that's a nice size. It is. All right, cool. Well, we got to, you know, what we have to say first. First, I have to find out what your first memory is of someone sewing or quilting in your life. Um, of someone sewing, not really quilting. Uh, my mom had a treadle machine. I grew up in Macon, Georgia, um, and she did uh, really just mending. Nothing that I would yeah. uh, really characterize as creative. That's not a negative. It's just, you know, she Practice. used mainly. Yeah, just yeah. practical using it for, yeah. for mending and hemming clothes, but it was a it was a treadle machine. Interesting. Did you ever sew on the treadle machine? I never did. Nope. Um, no. I actually have it. It's sitting in my garage right now. They brought it oh up. Oh my gosh, that's so cool. <laughs> Do you think you'll ever? Have you tried it? Have you ever tried the treadle machine? Um, I need to. I need to get it worked on. It needs a little bit of work to get going. Yeah. Um, but I actually have a. Uh, I have a, a plan, which I'm not sure I'll use the treadle machine. Um, there are art nights uh, in Northampton, and I've been thinking about this for quite a while. Um, I want to take a machine and set it up on the sidewalk, um, and just kind of like take uh, sewing and quilting to the streets, so to speak. Uh, <laughs> I like and I'll, that. I'll probably, I'll probably run a power cord from somewhere and, and just use, um, you know, a regular machine versus a treadle. Yeah. Interesting. <laughs> I like that idea. Yeah. Will you, yeah. On, will you take the machine and put it on the sidewalk, like not a table, but on the sidewalk? Oh, no, I mean, I'll have it on a table. I'll have it on a table. And, and my idea, I've been thinking about this for a while, but my idea is to, um, you know, have some pieces of fabric and things that as people come by, if they're interested, I could talk to them about uh, sewing and quilting and yeah. have them have them sit at the machine and work on it. I was actually inspired and I should know this quilter's name. And unfortunately I don't, she actually taught at QuiltCon, but um, this was years and years ago. I read uh, a blog post um, and she actually hooked up a treadle machine to a bicycle and took it to Burning Man. No way. Are you serious? Yeah, that's yeah I'm so serious. Cool. Oh, that's yeah. Craziness, and, and I've I've been thinking about it like ever since. Like, oh, that would be super cool, and and so people would walk by at Burning Man, and and you know she had like a picture of like some guy who was like in the nude, like sitting at the table, um, sitting at the machine, like sewing. So they would stop by and so oh, great. That is so awesome. I love that idea. That's so funny. Yeah. I'm kind of strangely obsessed with treadles right now, but um, know nothing about them. But I think they look. I really, I either, I imagine that either it would be so much fun or it would just be like, like we got our kid a drum set once for Christmas and like we quickly realized that none of us were coordinated to do this activity. It was like <laughs> 20 minutes in. So I think yeah. that might be a treadle situation too of like, uh, yeah, no. <laughs> but, but so, yeah, so as, as a kid, I never really did any um, sewing. I had a neighbor who showed me cross stitch and I think I made like one little cross stitch thing. 
And then I made a latch hook rug kit. I don't know if you remember those from like the Yeah, seven. I made one of those. Yeah, my sister, it's like the only thing my sister ever made. Yeah. <laughs> she made one of those. So I, I, I did that. And then um, I actually, uh, at one point, uh, this was like during the height of the, um, uh, what were those dolls that you could adopt? The oh, cabbage right. patch dolls. Right, right, the cabbage so, patch dolls. Right, yeah, right, some I remember them. They were like soft sculpture, and I took a I took a class to make soft sculpture dolls, and I made mm-hmm. one. Interesting. Uh, but so how I got into to quilting, if you want me to tell you that story. I totally do. That was what I was, my next question was, oh, well, sorry. your mom mended, but how did you get to what you're doing now? Yeah, so it was totally by chance. So I grew up in Macon, Georgia. After college at the University of Georgia, I lived in Texas and Louisiana for a few years. Um, I worked at a newspaper in New Iberia, Louisiana for about a year. Um, And then I moved to New York City. um, And uh, uh, out of the blue, I was I was dating someone at the time and they got accepted into law school at NYU. So uh, we moved to uh, New York City and um, uh, when I was living in New York, I lived in New York for about eight and a half years. Uh, wow. so this was, this was around, um, 2000. It was before, uh, yeah, it was, I think it was around 2000. I was at a, uh, park one day called Wave Hill. It's, uh, in the Bronx on the Hudson river. And they have a very small, um, what they refer to as kind of a museum, but they have a very small art, uh, display space it's uh just one small room and there was an exhibit of art quilts from a variety of new york uh quilters and i walked in and um they just kind of blew me away and on the spot i just kind of said i want to try to make a quilt these are like amazing so your (laughs) first really interaction was with art quilts which is super interesting because most people don't come in that way I know. And, and, it's, and it's really interesting because I, that was how I started and it was my intention to make art quilts. Um, and so what happened was, so I got interested and there, at the time there was a, there was one quilt store in Manhattan and I went to the, to that store, ended up buying a couple of magazines, quilting magazines, and it never worked out in terms of uh, taking a class. And so in 2002, I moved to Western Massachusetts, where I live now. And uh, after I moved here, I bought a sewing machine, uh, uh, just a real entry-level machine that I got at a Kmart that was going out of business. And and I originally tried to learn um, using Quilting for Dummies. I went to to a bookstore and bought Quilting for Dummies. And, And even then, like I hadn't no sewing experience. So they even quilting for dummies said like use a quarter inch seam allowance. And I had no idea what they were talking about. So I struggled with that. And then I ended up taking a beginning quilt class at, um, in a small town in Western Massachusetts called Shelburne Falls. And the teacher that I had was, um, her name was Ellen DeGrave and she was just wonderful. She had just a, a really laid back, um, attitude. Um, and, you know, it was a lot of fun and we, you know, laughed a lot, but also learned a lot. Yeah. And I made a, um, I made a log cabin quilt. And even before I had finished that class, I um, made another quilt outside of the class, a split rail fence um, quilt and knew from the beginning that I was just like, wow, I really enjoy this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep doing it. So interesting. Okay. I got a, a th- about a thousand questions. Sure. So first, were you already artistic when you saw those art quilts in New York? Were you already prone to doing artistic work or was this something brand new? Um, interestingly enough, I wasn't really doing any kind of visual arts. I was living in Brooklyn at the time. I was working actually, uh, I first worked in book publishing for about three and a half years. I worked for a literary agent and then I made the switch into public relations and started doing uh, public relations for a lot of dot com companies and, and tech companies, and um, so that was kind of my my day job. And yeah. I was at that time really thinking about taking um, some pottery or ceramics classes, and even thought about buying a wheel. But you know, living in New York, and it never occurred to me to to look for kind of shared studio space or anything like that. It just never occurred to me. So I, I wasn't doing any visual arts. I was um, writing fiction. Um, I wrote some short stories and had them published and wrote a couple of novels that were unpublished, um, but nothing visual. 
Um, and I, I really wanted something to do visually and I never felt like I was very good at, at painting or drawing. So that's how I ended up. Um, different, right. That's really interesting. Huh? All right. So you, um, you started looking at art quilts, then you took a traditional class. The other question sort of came up to me is sort of what, you know, I think about like our elementary school teachers and how important they are to us. I wonder what, what's that local teacher, that first interaction, how important is that? in do you think in this ecosystem because we talk about people always wanting to be like i a lot of people aspire you are national teachers or aspire to be that or they're but like that one person that like helps you understand what a quarter inch seam is like I, it just struck me that we don't we don't focus enough on that first person that helps you sort of into this world you know um, I agree. And I, I um, occasionally see Ellen out and about in, in, you know, our town and, you know, always uh, say hello. And we um, sit and talk. She's not as active on social media, unfortunately, but I show her photos whenever I run into her on my phone and she's always um, super impressed. But, but I think it's, I think it's invaluable. And whenever, you know, I'm, I'm a member of lots of Facebook quilting groups, everything from, uh, men who quilt to uh, quilting for beginners. And whenever someone comes into those groups, I always suggest like, because a lot of people will say, go to YouTube, go to YouTube, which yeah, right, right, honestly, right. When, when I started, YouTube wasn't around like that. Mm -hmm. That wasn't a resource. Yeah. And it, in fact, I, I met a, um, uh, a quilter who happened to be a guy, Sean Quinlan, mm -hmm. uh, uh, via a Yahoo group. And he, this was, again, this was like 2002, and he actually mailed me a uh, videotape um, with some basic techniques. Um, so, 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 yeah, I mean, YouTube is a, is a great resource, but I always, my advice is always, like, find a local class, find a local teacher, because, yeah. I mean, I guess it depends on how people learn, but for me, it's invaluable to have that, that yeah. um, human interaction with someone who can sit down and just show you. Right. Right. That's interesting. What role do you think the guilds play in that? Do you feel like they're a space for, for teaching and learning as well? Or do you feel like a traditional class is a better way to go? Um, I, I definitely think that, that guilds are, are um, helpful in that way. I'm not sure in terms of like the basic skills, I would, I would probably lean more towards advising someone to, yeah. to um, go with a beginning class versus um, a guild because usually for the most part, I think most people who are members of guilds tend to be, um, you know, have some expertise. And um, I yeah. think sometimes even, even for me, like sometimes I forget that like, you know, at this point I've been quilting since 2002, there's like just things that I do that I don't think about as being, yeah. you know, right. that a beginner wouldn't understand. Exactly. Like, yeah, it's funny. Like you don't even realize what you know until like you start to talk to a beginner and you're like, oh crap! Right, there's a whole bunch of <laughs> things, things you must, we, things you're taking for granted. It's really interesting. Um, all right. So, uh, what about? So, tell me, like, you're doing a bunch of things. So, tell me about the 365 quilt because I watch you on Facebook uh, posting on that, and it's beautiful. So, tell me what your thought. What is the 365 quilt? And tell me your progress or what you're doing there. Sure. The 365 quilt was started by an Australian quilter. Her name is Catherine Kerr, K-E-R-R. Um, and if you Google 365 quilt and her yeah. last name, K-E-R-R, you'll find the website. Um, she started it in 2016. Um, and it's basically a sampler quilt. The best way to describe it, if someone is familiar with quilts, is it's um, similar to like a Dear Jane quilt. Right. Uh, so every block is different. And what you do is um, at the beginning of the year, you subscribe to her email newsletter and each day you get a pattern. Um, and then uh, after about three months, she ends up taking down the, those patterns. But, you know, if you're subscribed to the, to the newsletter, like I keep them all in Evernote, which is this, you know, That's digital great. tool yeah. that I use. Uh, yeah. And, uh, and you know if you if you finish the the quilt i'm now on june 17th you are uh, your head yeah, i am <laughs> um 
but if you, yeah, because I started it actually in 2016, put it aside and have been. Right, because I'm looking at this year, they're doing 2016. She's doing 2016 again. So right. the 2016 will be repeated in 2019. So that's nice. Like you started, yeah. you're going to be like, look, we're back. <laughs> um, uh, but so I'm a member of a, of a 365 group on um, Facebook and a lot of those people have already finished and believe it or not, some of them are starting to work on a second version, oh which is my just, gosh. that's insane. I mean, yeah. I, I, I mean this, when I finish it, it'll be an heirloom. Uh, I won't do another one Yeah. <laughs> because I can't remember what the, the final dimensions are, but it turns out to be a really, you know, very sizable quilt. Yeah. Now how hard, Tell me about, first of all, your, the colors you've chosen are really pretty, but did you find that hard to figure out what you were going to do for your colors of your, I find that on big projects, my biggest thing. I really like just mope around for a bunch of time. Sure. So I, um, uh, when I first started it, I did it, I, I chose the colors very much on a whim and I was at that time still very much on a, you know, solid fabric kick. So I decided to do mine in solids and yeah. not, not a ton of the 365 quilters use solids. And I chose, um, because what you start out doing is you work and the size of these blocks, um, are three and a half inch. Um, oh my gosh. so we're talking about very small piecing, tiny, tiny. Um, and oh. so, and so these blocks are kind of a dark pattern palette to start out with. So I started out with dark green or various shades of green mm -hmm. and orange. And that was really just a, a gut um, instinct. And, and where the difficulty came in is then once you finish that first inner border of, of the small dark blocks, then she has you uh, make um, a light border that goes around that. And the light blocks are a little bit bigger. They're six and a half inch un unfinished. Um, but my transition from the, the, uh, the, the dark palette to, to the light, I was still using that, that still same, um, uh, um, palette of, of green and orange, but it, it was really challenging for me to figure out what that light palette was going to be. Yeah. Um, I was on a retreat and was sitting next to a guy and I kept joking. I was like, I'm sure you're going to change seats eventually because I, spent probably literally two days agonizing and just <laughs> see you make me feel better like, you really do make me feel better because I just like I don't know it's just like the pressure the colors it's like the choice because it's like it's either going to work or not work uh, just based on that decision alone you know and it's like oh I don't know it's very stressful that's and funny. you know I I I could probably do with taking some color classes and I have um quilting friends um, there's a number of um, nationally known quilters in our area, including Tim Natar and Ann Fiedelson um, and others. And um, Timna especially teaches color. And I'm always just really just blown away by her use of color. And it, um, mm -hmm. uh, so for me, it's, it's a lot of just very much instinctual. Um, I do know that, you know, that first, that first, um, uh, the first quilt I made, the log cabin quilt, I look at it now and it's, it's really painful to me yeah. um, because I was just grabbing colors off of the shelf or fabrics off of the shelf and didn't really um, think about hue or value or, or anything. And, um, and it shows, but um, over the, over time, I've certainly paid attention a lot more to color. So. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. I mean, I think you, I don't know. I feel like I've gotten to a place where I recognize that and I, I you probably right. Like taking classes would be a good idea at this point. I, I, my daughter's an art, an art, uh, artist. She's been uh, like advanced art stuff her whole life. So I just make her come in do the colors. I don't know what I'm going to do when she goes to college. Cause I'll be like, uh, can you come home for the weekend? <laughs> I have to start a new quilt. I don't know. It's well, the, one of the quilters I mentioned earlier, Ann Fiedelson, who who's local, and she actually had a quilt in, in Quilt Con this year. Um, uh, her background is she was a she was a painter for for years, and before she got into quilting, and so she's I've talked to her a lot about color, and you know one of the things that she's talked about, which kind of blows my mind, and it it makes me, you know. Um, really take a step back when I'm contemplating colors is she points out that, you know, you have a, 
a, you can pick out a fabric and you can pick out a color and you, you know, might want to go with that, but you have to keep in mind that that color can change based on what it's next to. Um, interesting, isn't it? Yeah. I thought about it that way. It's so yeah. interesting. I feel like I'm getting more and more safe on my color choices and not, I also just, we're almost done with the gypsy wife and, oh my gosh, that one nearly <laughs> murdered me because, uh, like, even though we cho- I chose a color palette, I chose like green, purple, and gray and black. And, um, and, but the amount of green and gray and purple fabric now that I have is like way out of control. Um, <laughs> so, I don't know. I, I think it's the fun part, but I think they're also stressful. All right. So tell me, you're going to retreat soon. Where, what retreat, what role do retreats play in your life and where are you going soon? Sure. Um, so on Tuesday, I am going to the 21st quilt guy retreat. Um, it's a, it's a retreat um, with all guys, all male quilters. Um, it started uh, from originally from a Yahoo group, um, which was called the Quilt Guy Yahoo group. This was before Facebook was widespread. Um, and we would do various things. We would obviously, obviously trade, um, you know, it was all email at that point. So we would talk about techniques. And then at some point, someone in there said, you know, I've noticed that there's a lot of people in the uh, New England area. Would anyone be interested in getting together on like a Saturday or Sunday sometime? And at that point, there were two members of um, this Yahoo group who owned a quilt store in Woodstock, uh, uh, New York, and they offered the use of their store and they had um, workshop space upstairs above their store. So we had the first retreat and now we'll have the 21st one and it's two times a year. Mm-hmm. And um, at this, at this point, I mean, it's, I mean, I honestly can't imagine my life without it because these right. guys, there's a core group of probably 12 to 16 members that, um, mm-hmm. that have gone to almost every one and they've become yeah. just like dear friends. Yeah. So, uh, I love that. I love um, that. So yeah, and, and and it keeps expanding. So it started out where it was um, like Thursday afternoon through Sunday, and now I'll be there from Tuesday until Sunday. <laughs> I yeah. like that. That's really great. And so, do you? Why do you like retreats? Like, what is it about? If someone hasn't been on a retreat before, why? Why? Why do you go to a retreat? Um, well, I think I think part of it is, and you know, I can you know, only speak for myself, but I think it's, you know, kind of a common experience, Um, especially, and and I'll just put it out there. I mean, I have two kids, I have a full life. I, you know, don't, you know, I'm not in the quilting industry in terms of, you know, my career. I I work as a a marketer, Um, you know, but my life is busy. I do try to, you know, get in some sewing um, usually uh, once a day. Sometimes it doesn't always happen. Yeah, me too. But, but so, you know, I think the the thing about uh, retreats is you can get in some really, um, you know, amazing amounts of work to just concentrate and not have, um, and and to basically just kind of get away from your day to day life for a little while and focus on you know what brings you joy creatively, um, and you know to to really spend some quality time and, um, you know, most of the retreats that I go on because I also have a retreat that I do with my modern guild. Um, it's, you know, there's a lot of work that gets done. I mean, there's obviously a lot of um, socializing and conversations with people sitting around you um, during the day, conversations with people uh, during meals, because we do it at an inn in Vermont. And what, the inn, what, like, you, what inn do you go to in Vermont? Um, it's the Fullerton Inn in Chester, Vermont, which is in kind of the the southern part of Vermont. It's mm-hmm. just north of Brattleboro. I went to um, a retreat at the Strong House Inn in uh, Virgins, Vermont. Mm-hmm. Virgins, Vermont. It was fun. It was really yeah. Fun. Yeah. Very cool. Um, all right. So, and Vermont's not that far for you guys. No, you know? not. Yeah. Far but far. But people come from all over the country. There's yeah. a guy coming from... San Francisco, one from um, Illinois, um, several people from Canada come down. Oh, very, very, uh, that's very cool. Um, okay, so the question I have for you is, how do you pack for a retreat? 
because I find it that part stressful too of which project I'm going to work on, how much I'm going to get done. I think I overpack. Like what's your strategy for going to a retreat? Oh, I, I totally overpack. I mean, the guys are always teasing me that I like brought like the fabric store with me. That's funny. Uh, uh, because I, I, I tend to have a very short attention span when I'm um, working on something, especially yeah. if I'm doing it multiple days in a row in, in this case. Um, mm -hmm. Though I have to say lately, I have been really focused on the 365 quilt and I'm going to see how much I can get done while I'm at the retreat. That's but, um, but I do take a lot of backups because if I just get to the point where I like, you know, I can't look at a small green and orange block to save yeah. my life, then I'll, I'll put it away and work on something else. Um, yeah. And, and the reality is, I mean, I have, um, I don't know if you want to call them UFOs, but I definitely have, um, multiple projects going at any time. I actually wrote down a list the other day and I think I have nine um, quilts that are in various stages of completion. Oh, that's and not that, terrible. It, I mean, it's bad, but it's not terrible. That's pretty good, actually. Yeah. <laughs> Inventorying. Um, do you ever throw out projects? I'm just cleaning up, like just before um, there was a snafu, before the snafu occurred, this early this morning, I was cleaning and I, yeah, there were a couple I thought, I just don't like you. Like, is it okay to throw things out? Do you, or do you come around to them later? Um, I don't think I've ever thrown anything out. Really? Uh, I, I may come back to something and say, Oh, like, you know, I'm not, I'm not in love with that anymore. Or, yeah. or what was I thinking? But I haven't gotten to the point where I will throw something out. Interesting. Do you put, will you tear it apart? There's one that I'm thinking, maybe if I just uh, took it apart and did it something different. Have you ever done that? Do you ever like, just go, okay, well, let's just try it again. <laughs> um, I haven't really done that either. Um, usually, usually what, I, if, if I'm working on something and I'm, I'm not in love with it, I'll try to at least finish it. And, and if I'm thinking of, of ideas, if, if I guess what I'm saying is if I was thinking about, Oh, I'm going to tear this apart. Usually the way my mind works is I would say, I'm going to take this technique and use it in a different way. I finish it, but it. yeah. But just be like, got it. That makes sense. That's more reasonable, I think. <laughs> um, yeah, I think that's cool. All right. So today is National Quilting Day. It is. Which I am in protest of because I think every day should be National Quilting Day. <laughs> so, oh, I agree with you. Um, what do you think about this, having a holiday or having a day like this? Like, do you think that's necessary? Do you like it? Like what? I'm, I have no idea how it started, but there's national. Um, I think it was probably, I think it, if we look back at it, I mean, I'm, I'm just talking off the top of my head. I'm not yeah. looking at my computer. I think it was kind of a marketing thing on one of the, the quilting companies or fabric companies. And yeah. you know, I, I mean, um, I'm, I'm certainly not opposed to it. I think anything to, to celebrate, you know, the craft that we all enjoy and the art, that we all enjoy, I think it is a great thing. I mean, I think that, um, I mean, I, I, it, I looked at, at the beginning and I think some of this has to do with just being a male quilter and, um, and I'll, I'll, I'll be honest. I mean, I'll just, I'll put it out there. Like, yeah. um, you know, I'm, I'm straight and, um, I'm doing, you know, uh, uh, um, a craft that's, you know, commonly associated with, with women. Yeah. Um, and, you know, when I started in the early 2000s, I mean, you know, we're now at 2019. It, it was, you know, at least for me, it felt different. And I wasn't as open with coworkers and stuff about what I was, you know, okay. doing. But now I'm, uh, now I'm like totally out there. I mean, I, yeah. you know, the majority of my social media is me sharing whatever it is that I'm yeah. working on. Mm -hmm. So I, I think. That's really interesting. What do you think changed in the 20 years? Just the world changed? Like we're more accepting in general or did you just be like, Oh, you know, I, I, this is what I do and whatever. Like what? I think, I think for me, I think for me, it was kind of a, a point of like, Oh, this is what I do. And I'm, you know, I own it and I enjoy it and yeah. um, whatever. I mean, I don't, I'm, yeah. I don't really, you know, factor in what, what other people right. might, yeah. might think. Do you feel like, um, it's interesting because I feel a little bit that way too, because, you know, as a law professor, you know, I'm supposed to be, when people think of law professors as like, you know, the paper chase, right? So right. Um, quilting doesn't really connect. I mean, but now I just think like, whatever. I mean, I've, I'm at the state of like, I do this. It makes me smarter, not something, you know, like 
you have to be smart cookie to quilt because it's a, there's a lot of math <laughs> and oh, there's absolutely. a lot of things like don't you know like this is not this is not for the weak of heart yeah, um, absolutely and i guess what i was going to say about the the national quilting day is i think yeah. Um, I think too, like in our culture of, especially with digital media and social media yeah. um, and, you know, the use of screens, I think sometimes yeah. people who aren't um, crafters and it doesn't have to necessarily be quilting. It could be anything, knitting or whatever. They have this idea that like, you know, I, I've had people who aren't, who like see my Instagram feed or see my Facebook um, photo post and they'll say like, wow, that, that looks great. I mean, you know, you must've had a, you know, uh, you must have had a busy morning and I'm like a morning like that. What you were seeing, like took me months or weeks, like. Right, <laughs> right, right, exactly. They can't quite comprehend that. Yeah. All right. I found out about National Quilting Day. It's at, on, on the 22nd annual show of the National Quilting Association in Lincoln, Nebraska in June 1991. So I don't know what the math is when that begins. A resolution was passed and National Quilting Day was started. So it started at Lincoln, Nebraska, National Quilting Association. But I there think you that's go. interesting. So when did they start? 70, 1969 is when they start? My math is right. 1969 is when the National Quilting Association starts. And then by 1991, they think there's a re That would be such an interesting, we'll have to do some more interesting yeah. uh, research on that. But um interesting well okay so on this national quilting day what what are you doing i'll tell you what i'm doing but what do you do i'm doing a bunch of stuff but what are you doing today for a national uh, quilting work, day? working on my 365 quilt <laughs> that's great and yeah. you have a how much like when you're working on that do you have like a goal when you're do you work on it like, are you like, okay, I'm going to get these five blocks done today, or do you just wor work as much as you can and stop? Like, when you I usually just work as much as I can and stop. And, um, I mean, it would be a really good day if I could do five blocks in a day um, because these, you know, blocks are um, very intricate. Um, these are, like, a, a lot of, like, very traditional patterns. So, um, you know, there was one that I posted on – Facebook a couple of weeks ago. I can't remember the pattern off the top of my head, but it, it include it, it was a six and a half inch unfinished block, but it included um, 40 different half square triangles. So, oh my gosh, that's um, insanity. And, and the, and the half square triangles I had to like, you know, not only sew, but then I had to cut down and, you know, we're talking about like an inch to an oh inch. Oh my gosh. That's um, crazy. This. Yeah. So, so that one took me quite a while. So, so yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I just usually, um, I, I'm all, I've always got something I'm working on. Um, and, and usually, I haven't worked on one in a while, but usually if I just, if I really don't want to worry about looking at patterns and, and um, doing math and rulers, I, I'll work on a string quilt. Um, right. I've, made, I've made several string quilts. And usually what I'll do is if I do a big project and then I have scraps, I'll take the scraps and, and work on, on a string quilt. And that's where I'm just, you know, sitting down with um, paper as a stabilizer and just sewing and sewing. And it's just a lot of just, you know, mindless sewing of strips. Yeah. I like mindless sewing of strips or mindless sewing. Uh, it's, it's very meditative. I mean, that's one of the things that I discovered. And I think that's why I'm, I'm still doing quilting, um, you know, since I started in 2002, not only do I enjoy the finished product, but I find the whole process very meditative and very stress relieving. And, and I totally and, agree. And that's one of that's one of the reasons that I do a lot of it. Now, how did you like QuiltCon? You've been going to QuiltCon since the beginning, since. Um, no, I went to I went I've been to one QuiltCon before wow. um, in Savannah, right. um, which I really enjoyed. You went um, to the one in Savannah, Georgia. Yep, the one in Savannah, Georgia. Um, I my parents still live in Georgia, so I took my youngest son down with me, and they stayed with him. And I went to QuiltCon. Nice. Um, and enjoyed the show, and then also enjoyed the nightlife. Went out dancing with some quilting friends almost really? every night. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> I love it. Um, but I was going to say, I mean, one of the things that I really enjoy the most about QuiltCon, obviously, is the quilts and the vendors. Yeah. Um, but I really like being able to, um, meet people 
in real life that I know via social media because I have a very big um, uh, network online, both Instagram and Facebook of, of quilters. So it's great to finally have a chance to hang out with those people and talk quilts. Yeah, no, I think that's really great. I feel the same way. It's kind of remarkable to see kind of, feels like you have friends that you haven't met, which is a most remarkable thing in our world, you know? It is, it is. I mean, I wish they, I wish QuiltCon, I wish they would figure out something in terms of the, uh, the um, class situation, because I just, I don't know, like I wasn't going to go in the first day and, and deal with the, the site crashing and, you know, um, so I, I didn't get into any classes. Yeah. So I just, I just went down and, and enjoyed the show, yeah. enjoyed um, meeting lots of um, friends and hanging out and talking. Um, that's, nice. that's nice. That's very nice. Okay, I have uh, two questions, two questions left. Um, one is what, well, I guess I have three. Well, we'll, we'll okay. So Facebook, so um, social media, what role does that play, do you think, in how important is that to the quilting world at this point? Um, I think it's super important, but I'm curious what your thoughts are. Oh, I definitely think it's, I definitely think it's important. Um, I think not just, um, not just the social aspect, but I, I think, you know, um, sharing our work, sharing what we're working on. Um, yeah. And, um, and again, what, what you asked earlier about, you know, the importance of that local teacher. Well, I mean, the reality is there are people who go onto these forums and they may live in a very, very rural environment, or it might be a situation, you know, people come in and um, it's very obvious from the way that they're posting that, you know, they don't have the income to go out and buy the 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 it, it machine or the the you know top line fabrics um and so they may not be able to afford a class so they come into these forums and ask questions and i think it's invaluable for people to be able to to answer their questions and be a friendly voice um and you know some of them may make one quilt and never make another one again but then yeah. some of them you know may Six. latch yeah. on to it right it's true it's very true um, all right, and also the guild. So Modern Quilt Guild, you were president of your quilt guild in um, Northampton. Yeah, yes. and um, how important is that? Like, what role do the guilds play in our world at this point? That's a that's a good question. I'm not. Um, I mean, I, I think I think again, I think it, it provides a um, social aspect. I think it provides, um, if you are interested and want feedback yeah. and um, uh, want that um, uh, kind of contribution from your peers of like, oh, like maybe you want to think about this fabric for a border or this mm -hmm. color, or just, you know, um, I think there's part of it too. I mean, like I, I was saying, I mean, it, it's great to like share things on social media with people who aren't quilters, but they, at, at some point, they don't get it. I mean, I'm not, I'm not saying that in, a, in an exclusionary way. So I guess what I'm saying is the social element is great because if right. I take my 365 blocks and lay them out at, at, a, um, at, you know, my modern guild meeting, people know like, oh my God, like right. I know what went into that. And so yeah. there's this, I guess, you know, what I'm trying to describe is kind of a camaraderie. Right. Yep. I agree. I totally agree. And there's different types of camaraderie and kind of all, it's all good. You know what I mean? Like you don't have to choose one over the other and that's the, the beauty of the world that we live in, you know? Right. Uh, yeah. I think that's, that, that's really cool. Um, okay. Well, I'm totally, um, totally psyched that we, um, uh, chatted, uh, any intellectual property or, like what role does intellectual property play in your, well, in your not day job, <laughs> in your, in your <laughs> that's, that's, that's an interesting, interesting question because I know that, I know that, you know, you have asked that um, yeah. question. Um, and I, I do have a project in mind that I've thought about from an intellectual property standpoint. Um, and, you know, I, 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 almost hesitate a little bit to, to, to mention it because I don't think I'm going to spend the time 
Yeah. And to track down permissions, because to be honest with you, I don't think at this point that the permissions would be able to even be obtained. Um, and what, what I mean by that is, um, so this is several years ago, I um, bought some of the, uh, some of the, the fabric that you can feed through your printer. Uh -huh. yeah. um, and so I was, uh, I played around with a couple of photos, you know, family photos. And then um, I'm, I'm a huge reader. I, I love books and I've always been a voracious reader. And I have all of these old science fiction paperbacks from literally like the fifties and sixties. Uh -huh. um, so I scanned a couple of them and then transferred them onto fabric. And I love like the vibrant colors. And then I also yeah. like, um, I, what part are you, are you scanning the, the, um, covers? Yeah. 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 The, the artwork. Um, yeah. but the, but the reality is, I mean, you know, yes, I could like go to like some of these publishers, but a lot of these, a lot of these paperback. Okay. Well um, here, so they you, don't, they don't like, even exist anymore. You've totally hit the jackpot. Cause, um, I have a tool that helps us determine whether they're under copyright or not. Okay. So I think that the first, if they're from the fifties and early sixties, if they weren't renewed, they're in, out of copyright. So I think it would be super interesting to know that answer, right? That's yeah, the first I agree. question, how many are out of copyright or not. And right. then the other question is, you know, if you're doing a trans, I mean, you're not competing with them. It's not a market. First of all, do you think you'll sell the pattern or sell the print? And, and that was, that, I was just actually about to, I was actually going to ask you that because yeah. I would, I would, um, not sell it. it would no, well, be then you're not even that. Then I mean, if you're even if you're putting it into a show, it's not a big deal. That fair right. use will cover that transformative use of you exactly. Yeah, because we know that from the cases that we have that that's not a problem. But I still also would be really interested to know the cop. I mean, because let's say you let's say people like I love this. I do want a kit of it, and you're like, okay, well, well <laughs> or make fabric of this, right? So, like, a fabric company comes to you and says, "Hey, we should make fabric of this." Well, then you need to know the copyright status, and right, exactly. so that's my other hat. That's that's my day job is yeah. determining the copyright status of works, and we built a tool to do that. Um, but if you send me, um, we will probably have to cut this out because I don't want a thousand people sending me stuff, but. Yeah. Um, uh, if you send me a list of the books, if you send me a list of the the author, the title, and the date of publication, I'll run it through our system and see what happens. Okay, that sounds good. And I'll see, um, usually that costs like lots and lots of money, um, but we'll just do it for free and I'm really curious. And if you if you do end up doing it, uh, just love to know that you're doing it so we can use it as an example of like- Yeah, sure, sure. Picture the books to sort of say, these are the books I'm considering. Um, and we'll follow your progress if you end up doing it. But I, I'm really curious which books you, I mean, from my perspective, I'm curious how many were, how many are, how many do anybody care about or not? They had to renew them in the 28th year. And so they have to have had some, you know, somebody watching out for them. And that, that's, that's what I was going to say, because I know book publishing and, you know, m most of these publishers have been acquired years ago and yeah. even like the art contracts they probably didn't even hang on to that they've probably been thrown yeah. out by this point so um, interesting right yeah yeah but but it's it's interesting it's interesting all right well um, send me if you get a chance uh you don't even you can even just take pictures of them or whatever yeah, I will, you I will. In a, uh, if you do put it into an excel spreadsheet i can do bulk processing and just it'll take like 20 seconds for me to run it <laughs> okay. um, can't um that's okay too and i'll we'll see i would love to know how many of those book how many of those books are in the public domain yeah, that'd be great. So oh, interesting. Well, I can't believe like we had a lot on my side, a lot of snafus to get to this, but we did this. We we had we a did. We did. Uh, and it was so insanely lovely. I really, I look forward to, as I said, I'm following your progress on the, all the time on the 365 call. So <laughs> I will keep um, living vicariously through you as you make okay. that. I do that not think great. we can do it. So um it's awesome. Well, I thank you for your time today and I, and your patience with um, rescheduling. I really do appreciate it. Sure. Um, I, and, I enjoy doing this. Okay. Well, cool. Well, send me that list and let's, let's play a little bit with those. I think it'd be really I interesting. I will. Um, okay, cool. Awesome. Okay, great. Thanks. All right. Take care. Bye. Bye, Bye. So you've been listening to Just Want a Quilt, a research podcast coming out of Tulane University Law School. And I'm Elizabeth Townsend Gar. If you like this podcast, keep listening. Also, we have a Facebook group. Come join us. We talk about a lot of things. 
We also have an Instagram account. And of course, most importantly, I really hope you get a chance to quilt today.